This is Bamberg, a really beautiful city in northern Bavaria, undoubtedly one of the most attractive cities in Germany. Its old town is a UNESCO recognized World Heritage Site. It's a town full of history, dominated by the huge cathedral which shows that it was once the Prince Bishops of the Catholic Church who ruled here. But that rule was not always benevolent. At times it could be extremely cruel and violent and that is shown by the dreadful witch trials of the 17th century. Bamberg was the location of one of the largest series of witch trials in history. Together with those that happened elsewhere in what is today Germany, in cities such as Trier, Fulda and Würzburg, the trials claimed hundreds of lives in horrendous circumstances in which the accused had the choice of dying in excruciating pain under torture while attempts were made to force a confession or dying in excruciating pain by fire after a confession. Whereas in the countryside witch trials did not necessarily lead to a death sentence, in urban areas it was a different story. In Bamberg the overwhelming majority of those accused were sentenced to death and the period from accusation to execution was usually less than 20 days, showing how quickly people broke down under extreme torture. And as we shall see, the victims were usually the political foes of the church and the cause of the terror was economic. As I speak, I shall show you in the video what Bamberg looks like today. This is from my visit in June 2018. Many of the buildings you will see would be recognizable to both the victims and the perpetrators of these crimes which took place nearly 400 years ago and in particular the cathedral and the cathedral square. All of Europe was affected by a cold spell at the beginning of the 17th century. I believe that the main cause of this was the eruption of the Huayna Putina volcano is what is today southern Peru in February and March 1600. This was the greatest volcanic eruption in South America in historical times. I believe that the after effects could have dragged on for many years. As volcanic particles around the globe blocked sunlight, temperatures fell. Cold weather meant poor harvests, which meant hunger. To add to this, a number of other problems hit at the same time, making this the perfect storm. The first was the Thirty Years' War. As far as local rulers were concerned, this had to be financed and wars are costly. At times of conflict, the last thing that rulers want is anything which hits their tax base. But as food became scarce and production dropped, how could the war be paid for? The Thirty Years' War was essentially a religious conflict and that type of conflict is usually the most bitter. This was the greatest disaster to befall Central Europe until World War II and in places in what is today Germany there was a population decline greater than two-thirds. This was not only due to military activities but uh, military activity played a large part in it. But added to the other things at the same time, then that caused the population decline. The second part of the storm was a period of hyperinflation caused in part by the change in the amount of silver that was being brought to Europe from South America. This is a very complex uh, theme and I don't really want to go into it now. The third problem was that of the plague which hit every large town in this area of Germany from around 1624 to 1636. Now in uh, Britain we're very uh, familiar with the uh, plague which hit London in 1665 and this was all part of the same wave of the plague which happened uh, in the 17th century. At the same time people could look back to a different time when things were better, when they did not have those problems which beset them at present. 
Clearly there was something wrong within their society and that problem needed to be found. The solution found conveniently by the church was to blame the devil and those allied to him on earth, the witches. After all, it was the witches who could change the temperature of the weather and thus stop crops from growing. Prince Bishop of Bamberg, Natad von Tumken, permitted witch trials at the end of the 16th century, even before the onset of the Cold Period, but that was probably more due to his fight with the Reformation and wanting to root out Luther, Lutheran supporters. There were a number of trials in the period 1613 to 1619 as harvest declined and in particular the bad harvest of 1616 is notable. However, the worst period occurred during the reign of Prince Bishop Johann Georg Fuchs von Dornheim from 1626. When a sudden frost severely damaged crops there was a wave of arrest and a special prison to hold the suspects was built called the Judenhaus. In 1628 alone there were 192 documented trials. The Juden House was built for those accused of witchcraft in Bamberg. The prison was constructed in 1627 on the order of the Prince Bishop of Bamberg and we still have an engraving of it even though the building was torn down in 1635. The Juden House was used through the duration of the witch trials. It contained 26 single cells as well as two larger cells for groups of people. An inscription on the portal read, Dishite Justifia Moniti et non temnere divos. This is a quote from the Aeneid by Virgil. Let it be a reminder of justice of which the gods cannot ignore. Internal walls had biblical inscriptions. Torture was widespread and we shall look at an eyewitness account from one of the victims. Sources give various amounts of those contemned by these trials. On 11th of February 1632, as the Swedish army approached Bamberg during the Thirty Years' War, the prisoners were released on condition that they kept silent about everything that had happened there. The trials affected both men and women, although the majority of the victims were female. Being rich or having property was especially dangerous as not only the prince bishops but also a jealous neighbour or other might seek to pillage the property of the victim. This in one case, this is one case where being poor might have been an advantage. You had nothing to steal and thus a denunciation was far less likely. Here we shall look at the fate of some of the victims. Georg Hahn was a doctor and a member of the city council of Bamberg. He was married to Katharina Hahn and had two daughters, Katharina and Ursula, and four sons, Adam, Karl, Daniel and Leonard. He was well known in the town and the public opposed the policy of witch persecution by Prince Bishop Johann Georg Fuchs von Dornheim. He decided to bring this to the attention of the imperial diet in Speyer and left that city on the 27th December 1627. As soon as he was gone, his wife was arrested for witchcraft. Katharina Hahn was tortured in order to extract a confession and was then burnt alive on the 16th of January 1628. The same fate befell her daughter shortly afterwards. When Georg Hahn returned to Bamberg, he found that his wife and daughter had been judicially murdered. Maximilian I, Elector of Bavaria, realising the danger to Georg Hahn, attempted to save him by offering to employ him but the messenger he sent to Bamberg to deliver this message was prevented from reaching the city. Shortly after, Georg Hahn was arrested, accused of sorcery, and under torture he confessed and was executed on the 24th of January 1628. The following year, his remaining daughter Ursula Hahn and his son Adam Hahn was arrested and burned. His remaining three sons were able to find protection in an abbey until the end of the trials. Johannes Junius was born in 1573 and he was burned to death on 6th of August 1628. He left a detailed report in a letter to his daughter which we shall look at here. His offence was clearly political. 
He had been the Burgermeister several times in 1614, 1617, 1621 and 1624 to 1628. He fell under suspicion after his wife was executed for witchcraft. A previous Burgermeister, Georg Neudecker, had been arrested for witchcraft in April 1628 and under torture named Junius as an accomplice, leading to his arrest in June 1628. Eunius initially denied everything, but after one week of torture he confessed. He was subject to thumb screws, leg vices and being hanged by his hands behind his back. On 5th of July 1628, unable to take the torture anymore, he said that he had renounced God for the devil and that he had seen 27 of his colleagues at a witches meeting. In his confession, Eunius relates that in 1624, while in a difficult financial state, he was seduced by a woman who later proved to be an agent of the devil and threatened to kill him unless he renounced God. At first Eunice refused, but soon more demons materialized and attacked him further, finally convincing him to accept the devil as his God. He took the witch name of Crix and became acquainted with several local townspeople who were also allied to Satan, and they congratulated him. Thereafter, he regularly attended witches' meetings, to which he rode on the back of a flying black dog. At one such meeting, he attended a black mass at which Beelzebub himself made an appearance. Although his fellow witches and familiar demons had commanded him to kill his children in their name, he had been unable to perform the sacrifice for which he was beaten. However, he did admit to having sacrificed his horse and of burying a sacred waif, and that's the thing that they give you at Mass uh, in a Catholic um, ceremony. We know much of this because on 24th of July 1628 he managed to write a letter to his daughter Veronica which was smuggled out of jail by a guard. Here I quote the letter in full. The letter is a bit disjointed, this in part due to the translation Obviously it was written 400 years ago, so the language used uh, was different to today, and I, I tried to uh, replicate that as much as I could. And it, But also one thing that comes through is the pain of a man who was awaiting his dreadful execution after suffering horrendous torture. Many hundred thousand good nights, dearly beloved daughter Veronica. Innocent have I come into prison, innocent have I been tortured, innocent must I die. For whoever comes into the witch prison must become a witch or be tortured until he invents something out of his head. And God pity him, be thinks of something. I will tell you how it has gone with me. When I was first put to the torture, Dr. Brown, Dr. Kotzendorfer and two other doctors I did not know were there. Then Dr. Brown asked me, Kinsman, why are you here? I answered, through falsehood, through misfortune. Hear you, he says, you are a witch. You will confess it voluntarily. If not, we will bring in witnesses and the torturer for you. I said, I am no witch. I have a pure conscience in the matter. If there are a thousand witnesses, I am not anxious, but I gladly hear them. Now the Chancellor's son was set before me, and afterward Hopf van Ellas. She had seen me dance on Haupt's moor. I answered, I have never renounced God and will never do it. God graciously keep me from it. I'll bear whatever I must. And then came also, God in highest heavens have mercy, the torturer. He put th thumb screws on me, Bo both hands bound together so that the blood ran out the nails and everywhere, so that for four weeks I could not use my hands, as you can see from the writing. Thereafter they first strapped me, bound my hands behind me and drew me up in torture. Then I thought, heaven and earth were at an end. Eight times did they draw me up and let me fall again, so I suffered terrible agony. And this happened on Friday, 30th of June, and with God's help I had to bear the torture. When at last the executioner led me back into prison, he said to me, Sir, I beg you, for God's sake, confess something, for you cannot endure the torture for which you will be put to. And even if you bear it all, yet you will not escape, not even if you were an earl. But one torture will follow the other until you say you're a witch. Not before that, he said, will they let you go, as you may see by all their trials. For one trial is just the same as another. And so I begged, since I was in a wretched plight, to be given one day for, for thought and a priest. The priest was refused me, but the time for thought was given. Now, my dear child, 
see what hazard I stood and still stand. I must say that I am a witch, though I am not, must now renounce God, though I have never done it before. Day and night I was deeply troubled, but at last came to me a new idea. I would not be anxious, since I had been given no priest with whom I could take counsel. I would myself think of something and say it. It was surely better to say it with mouth and words, even though I had not done it. And afterwards I would confess it to the priest and let those answer for it who had compelled me to do it. And so I made my confession, as follows, but it was all a lie. Now follows, dear child, what, con what I confessed in order to escape the great anguish and bitter torture for which it was impossible for me any longer to bear. Then I had to tell what people I had seen at the witches' meeting. I said I had not recognized them. You old rascal, I must set the torture at you. Say, was not the Chancellor there? So I said yes. Who besides? I had not recognized anybody. So he said, take one street after another, begin at the market, go on to one street and back on to the next. I had to name several persons there. Then came the long street. I knew nobody. I had to name eight persons there. Then the Zinkelwert, one person more. Then over the upper bridge, the Georgtor, on both sides, knew nobody again. Did I know any, nobody in the castle? Wherever it may be, I should speak without fear. And this continuously, they asked me on all the streets, though I could not and would not say more. So they give me to the torturer. Told him to strip me, shave me all over, and put me to the torture. The rascal knows one on the market's place. It's with him daily, yet he won't mention him. By that they meant Dimitri, so I had to name him too. Then I had to tell what crimes I had committed. I said nothing. Draw the rascal up! So I said that I was to kill my children, but I killed the horse instead. It did not help. I had also taken a sacred wafer and had desecrated it. When I said this, they left me in peace. Now, dear child, here you have my confession for which I must die. And they are sheer lies and made up things, so help me God. For all this I was forced to say through fear of the torture which was threatened beyond what I had already endured. They never leave off with the torture till one confesses something, be he never so good. He must be a witch. Nobody escapes, though he were an earl. Dear child, keep this le letter secret so that people do not find it, else I shall be tortured most piteously, and the jailers will be beheaded. So, so strictly is it forbidden. Dear child, pay this man some money. I have taken several days to write this. My hands are both lame. I am in a sad plight. Good night for your father. Johannes Junius will never see you again. 24th of July, 1628. Dear child, six have confessed against me at once. The Chancellor, his son, Neudegger, Zana, Hofmeister's Unsel, and Hopfen Elsa, all false, through compulsion, as they told me, and begged my forgiveness in God's name before they were executed. They know nothing but good of me. They were forced to say it, just as myself was. For the fate of the next victim, I would like to quote directly the work of Jeff Arp, a pal from him, which is called Frost Witches, the spark of the Bamberg witch craze. Sometime in 1629, or possibly 1630, Lawrence Kempfen, Seabacker's wife, known as Kempfen, was put on trial. Her experience must have been an episode of sheer terror. In the extant documents, a total of 13 witnesses accused Kempfen of engaging in witchcraft and weather-making. Specifically, she was accused of spitting hot and cold, made light with her own eyes spitting hot and cold. She had spit hot, spit heat, she had blown out heat, blown heat and sparks. The witnesses were absolutely convinced of Kempfin's power. However, it was not weather-making that was her greatest offence. Throughout the document, chronologically and circumstantially, the frost was noted over and over. The twelfth witness, an annoy Heimbein makes the obvious and fundamental connection. The accused had made the suggestion to put a frost on the fruits, since it would make the goods for the common wage earner so expensive and costly. Kempfin's crime was not the ability to make hot or cold. Her crime, and what most likely cost her her life, was the threat that her abilities presented. The final person 
uh, I shall look at her. her final victim is Dorothea Flock. She came from Nuremberg and was born around 1608. She was a second wife of Bamberg councillor Georg Heinrich Flock. They lived at Langestrasse 32 in Bamberg. The first wife of Georg, Apollonia, had been executed for witchcraft in May 1628. Based on an anonymous accusation, Dorothea was arrested in December 1629 and imprisoned for alleged adultery, even though she was in a stage of advanced pregnancy. She escaped, but shortly afterwards she was recaptured and accused of witchcraft. Her husband fled to Protestant Nuremberg to the relatives of his wife. The Hoffmans were a respected, wealthy and influential merchant family, and they hoped to use their connections to get Dorothea freed. The family pointed out that there was no evidence against her and succeeded in getting her place of imprisonment moved from the witch's prison to that of the court prison where conditions were more bearable for a lady about to give birth. An appeal was made to the Imperial Council in Vienna which granted the temporary release warrant on the 18th of March 1630 to allow for childbirth and for getting legal assistance. When the Prince Bishops did not respond a further warrant was issued on 23rd of March 1630. There was no response until the 17th of April 1630 when news came that a daughter had been born and that the child was in good health. On 28th of April, Dorothea Flock was moved once more to the witch's prison. A further demand for her release was sent by the Imperial Council on the 11th of May 1630. In the meantime, Following the use of torture, Dorothea Flock confessed to the crime of witchcraft and was sentenced to death on the 14th of May. Aware that a release order was about to arrive, the Prince Bishops accelerated her killing. Before execution, Dorothea Flock was to have been gripped with red-hot pincers, then burnt alive. However, in view of the impending arrival of a release warrant, the process needed to be speeded up so she was presented with what is called a Bamberg Mercy Sheet, which meant that her head would be cut off before her body was burnt. In usual circumstances, a Mercy Sheet could be issued if the condemned agreed to hand over all his possessions to the church before execution, thus sparing the victim of a horrifying death. However, this Mercy Sheet shows very much what these accusations against the innocent were all about. It was about grabbing their wealth and destroying their lives to the benefit of the Prince Bishops and the local Catholic Church. Another way of putting it is simple theft with murder. Dorothea did not have wealth. That belonged to her husband and he had arranged a release warrant and the messenger bringing it was already in Bamberg and waiting. Rapid action was needed. So she was quickly beheaded, only minutes before the release papers were handed over to the Prince Bishops. The remnants of her corpse were burnt to ashes on the nearby Schirleinsplatz because of her alleged misdeeds by witchcraft, her reneging God Almighty and the Holy Trinity. After a while, peasants noted burning witches does not resolve the problem of poor harvest and that anyone could become a victim. It must have got to a stage where the terror was one of potential denunciation through malice for economic benefit or to avoid paying a debt. Peasants refused to supply the wood for burnings. Following the case of Dorothea Flock, at a meeting of the electoral princes in Regensburg in the summer of 1630, pressure was put on the church. As a result, the Catholic Church suspended the trials, although suspects continued to be held. The witch trials came to an end with the liberation of prisoners by Protestant Swedish troops in 1632. Following the end of the Thirty Years' War, the witch trials were resumed, but never again at the same intensity. The last witch that I know of in Europe to be executed happened in 1781 in Kempton, in what is the day southern Germany, Alboy. Nonetheless, the hunt for witches in some parts of the world exists to this day.